So, good morning. My clock says 8.45, so we should start. Can you hear me? Okay, because I'm very tired, so we shall see. So, today I would like to finish up on our discussion of the <coughs> physics and dynamics of the interstellar medium. And one of the important aspects is the formation of the dense most and most cold regions of the interstellar medium, molecular clouds. So I would like to spend the first, let's say, 10 to 15 minutes just giving you an overview over the current status of how we think molecular clouds do form and what we need in terms of modeling or theoretical approach to address this physical process. Good. So this reminds me of today. Um, and it also reminds me of clouds. So this is an image I have taken from Eric Doyle and um, <coughs> Leo Blitz. And what they have done is they have taken uh, atomic hydrogen emission from the galaxy here. It's, <coughs> uh, I forgot the number of the galaxy. And uh, so the emission of the uh, atomic hydrogen, H1, is this orange stuff in the background. And they plot, in terms of these dots with different sizes, the molecular clouds they have identified. And you see a correlation between where the molecular cloud sits, where the molecular gas sits, and the atomic gas sits. Typically, in a coarse sense, you find the um, carbon monoxide emission that traces molecular hydrogen. Um, at the higher density peaks of the atomic hydrogen. So there is a close correlation, but not always here in the outskirts. There is some extended emission from uh, H1, but there is no H2. So how can we address it? We have seen that cooling is typically proportional to the density square, because by collision you have to bring two particles together that then excite internal degrees of freedom that then have certain chances to de-excite radiatively. And if you're in an optically thin regime, you can get rid of the photon, and it carries away some of what used to be kinetic energy in the system. So it is clear that the cooling rates will depend on the density distribution. And we can ask a simple question, what type of density fluctuations do we have in the interstellar medium? And we have seen that there are quite a number of different agents that can drive turbulence, that can give rise to density fluctuations. And very coarsely speaking, again, in this cartoon picture, you can say, well, I have a fluctuation spectrum. And now where I have the most densest and most massive fluctuation, maybe this is where I can get into this chemical phase transition and form molecular hydrogen. So in this cartoon picture, that would be here and here. But we also have learned that molecular hydrogen formation is also associated with global dynamical processes. So you could say, I have a background of fluctuating turbulence, but this is modulated by larger scale dynamical modes in the galaxy, say spiral density waves excited by neighboring galaxies. Think of M51 that we have seen yesterday. So then maybe the threshold for this formation has shifted to lower values, and suddenly you have more peaks and more material available for CO formation. So this could be a very coarse approximation to explaining why you see enhanced molecular cloud formation associated with spiral density waves. And why if you have, let's say, interacting galaxies and tidal tails, you find very strong, um, think of the antennae galaxy, the big tidal feature that connects the two nuclei of the merging galaxies, there you have very strong CO emission, very strong presence of molecular hydrogen, and hence very enhanced star formation rate. So how then, again in a very crude sense, can we relate it to the underlying turbulence? So this is the logarithm of the density, and this is just the density PDF I've shown you in extension uh, similar, <coughs> similar plots before. And the width of that depends on the Mach number. So very large Mach number, very small Mach number, no velocity at all, the homogeneous density distribution. 
Now, it turns out that you form at present days, at present metallicities, molecular hydrogen at the surfaces of dust. Again, what happens is you stick one H uh, atom on the dust surface, it can hop around, it finds another one, they, you know, pair up, that raises some heat. This heat is enough to beef them off the surface of the grain, and you have molecular hydrogen in the gas phase. <coughs> you can calculate roughly a rate. It is something like a giga year, 1.5 giga years, divided by the density in one particle per cubic centimeters. You can pick your favorite threshold for molecular cloud formation. Let's say you want to make molecular cloud within a dynamically reasonable time scale, 10 million years, so you need a mean density of 100, which is typically the densities you see in molecular clouds. So then you can make molecular hydrogen within 10, or yeah, within 10 million years. And you can simply ask yourself, what fraction of the gas is available in this section of the probability density distribution? And you can say, as a first approximation, this gives me some hint of the amount of molecular hydrogen available. Now, it's not as simple as that because this is just a snapshot of the density distribution and we will see soon that chemistry introduces a memory effect. So the efficiency of the process is actually much, much higher. But you will hear more about um, <coughs> star formation laws based on statistical properties of turbulence by Nick, um, probably either this afternoon or maybe tomorrow, and they all make use of the same thing, right? You take a distribution function in the density that you relate to the Mach number in the turbulent flow. I've shown you how this works two days ago. And then you say, I take a certain fraction at the high density rate and turn that into stars. And how you do that in detail depends on your favorite model. But this is the underlying physics that is behind all that. So you take turbulence or external perturbation, they give you a, a range of densities, you pick certain fractions out of this density distribution function, turn it into molecular gas, turn it into stars. And the most elaborate model that is on the market at the present comes from Phil Hopkins who uses uh, extended press Schechter analysis that you know from cosmology and applies it to this problem. Very, very smart. So I'm not so smart, I need to go to a computer. <coughs> so, but we can do similar things. We can set up a galactic disk and we can simply ask ourselves, when does it become gravitationally unstable? So which part of this <coughs> density distribution function are populated at what point in time? This is from a now very, very old <coughs> study that you think Lee did some time ago and you see if this zinc particles denoting gravitational collapse um, can be associated with molecular gas, you see some correlation. Not good because there's lots of physics missing, but nevertheless, we find a correlation between the surface density in the gas and the surface density of protostellar collapse or star formation. And this looks very similar to the Kennicutt-Schmidt relation. So in this extremely simple model, this is simply a uh, signpost of marginal gravitational instability in the galactic disk. But there is more to it. So there is a debate whether this is the right index. There is a debate at what scales the Kennicutt-Schmidt relation actually hold. There is a debate on how to convert, first of all, to the surface density of gas from, let's say, CO observation, how to convert to star formation rates. And there is a huge debate on how to interpret this. And I will not go into too much detail. Um, Nick will be saying a bit about it. And I can refer again to Rahul Shetty, who is here, who has worked on this problem. Um, so you can do a bit better. And you can now say, well, let's not just look at an isothermal gas that somehow has a mean temperature of the hydrogen gas in the galaxy. Let us allow for a multi-phase medium. So let us allow for something like a cold phase and something like a warm phase. And let us take a galaxy that is steered by external perturbations. So this is work by Claire Dobbs. 
And what she does is she takes this galaxy, she has a four-arm spiral to speed things up that cruises through her disk, and one can see that it structures the gas in these spurs and feathers and high-density regions. I showed it again. So what happens, the gas suddenly says, oh, I have the shock from the, um, from the spiral density wave that comes from the back. I feel compressed. I maybe slide along the spiral arm. There's lots of shear in the spiral arms, which maybe actually suppresses star formation in the spiral arms. If you look closely at M51, you see that you see very little, amazingly very little star formation associated with the actual spiral arm itself. It happens a bit behind. Maybe this is to do with shear. <laughs> and when it enters, it has structures. It has gained vortex motions. It builds these spurs and feathers that you see everywhere in these type of galaxies. And you can now do that for different types of galaxies with different, <coughs> let's say, densities, radiation fields, etc., etc. And you can plot a phase diagram. So you can look at the H2 fraction. So you do something like the Hollenbach rate, you have seen before. Um, <coughs> allow also for photo destruction of these gas with a very localized approximation. I discussed it later. And then you can look at the mean density and the H2 fraction you get. So these are 10 to the minus 2 particles per cubic centimeter, 1, 100, and 10,000. And you see you have something like a two-phase medium. You have an atomic tenuous phase, and you have a very dense and cold um, molecular phase. And you can, this was an SPH calculation, sit on an SPH particle, and as it goes through the galaxy, register whether it finds itself in a high-density H2 dominated region or when it enters or exits the spiral density wave and finds itself in a tenuous region, maybe it goes back to what it was, an atomic hydrogen blob of gas. <coughs> so you can indeed follow the trajectory. So this guy got compressed in the spiral density shock, got a relatively high H2 fraction, well, a few percent, but then it drops down again when it exits the spiral density wave. Then it hovers around down here, but then the next spiral density wave comes and now it gets caught. It is now part of a denser blob of gas that remains dense, remains self-shielded or well-shielded, and only very late towards the end of the simulation gets <coughs> exposed again. So you can play around with this very simple model. You can look at time scales of uh, molecular hydrogen formation. You can look at where this happens, what properties the clouds that form have. <coughs> Just one note on the time scales for H2 formation that is worked by Tamburo. They looked at the things galaxies, correlated it with the Heracles data, <coughs> CO observation, and they found on average a shift between where the H1 sits and where the H2 sits that can be associated with the streaming motions in the galaxy. So they found that first you form, well, you see an enhancement of atomic hydrogen, then slightly later you find an enhancement of the molecular hydrogen, and somewhat later you find star formation. Now this is beautiful, it fits my theory very well, however it is, um, this particular study is probably wrong. And if you do it more careful, let's say in the Andromeda galaxy at M51, uh, where you have beautiful, very high resolution data, you see that the situation is much more complicated. And you find both. You can find situations where actually the H2 forms earlier before it enters, quote, quote, the spiral arm. <coughs> so very confusing situation that tells you the streaming motions or the, let's say, small scale motions that are associated with spiral arms are very important. And it's simply not enough to take a global streaming motion and compress it from time to time. Good. Anyway, in our case, we get similar timescales for the formation of molecular clouds. And these timescales, we talk about here 20 million years, 40 million years, um, for different molecular, um, molecular hydrogen fractions, these are again in line with um, the timescales that um, 
Fukui infers for the molecular clouds in the large Magellanic cloud. So I think most of these things point towards a dynamical formation of molecular clouds in these type of spiral galaxies. I should point out that there are indeed other opinions. If you speak with Nick Scoville, for instance, um, in California, he would say molecular clouds live for 100 million years, simply because you see them also in the interarm regions and he would claim they are like bullets that cruise through the, um, through the medium. So you see, again, different people have different opinions and you see my more dynamical point of view here. You can add magnetic fields to these calculations. Many people have done it. In this case, the magnetic field is simply a tracer. It is dynamically not important. It is dragged along with the flow. But what you can do now is you can study the magnetic field configurations and you can look at what, for instance, dust polarization maps would give you of external galaxies. And you can see whether they are all look alike or not. And you can learn something about, say, dynamo processes in the galaxy. So this is now an overview, a very biased and very brief overview of what people have been doing in terms of forming molecular clouds. I now want to go a bit into the details of how you actually do that on the computer. So I show you again this image that um, Wolfram Schmidt has calculated some while ago because this is now the setting we want to deal with. We simplify the problem. We say we have a box of gas. Let's give it maybe 20, 30 parsecs across so that we have a good chance to find a mixture of the multiphase ISM, a tenuous warm atomic phase, and where we compress gas we hope to find molecular gas. But this calculation was done with an isothermal equation of state that does not justice to the thermodynamics of the gas. So what you would need to do is you would need to couple that with a local chemical network and you would need to figure out some way to couple all that to some radiation field that you assume just permeates the cloud or comes from the outside. Good. So the setup that I will be discussing looks something like that. Again, we have our box. We shine the interstellar radiation field in it from the outside. For the time being, and today at least, I will not include self-gravity, so I have no star formation inside, so I have no internal sources that would generate heat and radiation from the inside. So I would be interested only in the attenuation of this radiation field from the outside. I would shake this thing with the turbulent driving schemes I have discussed yesterday and I would um, add then time-dependent chemistry to that and see how the gas behaves if I change the chemical composition, if I change the density, if I change the ambient radiation field, if I change the cosmic ray flux, if I change, you know, whatever you want to change. Now, we have something like 100 and plus molecular species identified. There is again the same number of atoms and ions and things around. So your chemical network you in principle can deal with has gazillions of species and gazillions square chemical reaction. That is too much to couple it to the computer. So what you need to do is you need to break down your chemical reaction network into what you think is relevant. So if you want to do primordial chemistry, you only deal with, let's say, hydrogen, a bit of helium, a bit of lithium, the free electrons, the radicals of, um, of hydrogen, the deuterated hydrogen, etc. You can get by with a very simple chemical network. If you want to do molecular cloud formation in present days, you need at least to include grains, if you want to see the clouds, you want to know where carbon and oxygen and hence carbon monoxide sits. So you need to go to a slightly larger um, network and at present I think the best available network has something like 32 species. Some which have fast reactions are put into instantaneous equilibrium but others need the full-fledged non-equilibrium chemistry. So you can then pick out 
the reactions that you think are relevant to describe this network fully. So you notice there's no nitrogen, there's no silicates. <coughs> these are not so important for the cold neutron medium and not so important, certainly not important for the molecular clouds. They become more important if you go to very hot uh, conditions and they become important if you want to go to very high densities because then there are tracer molecules, um, ammoniac, N2H+, etc., etc. So this is a chemical network that is geared to describe the thermodynamics of gas, let's say, in a range of one particle per cubic centimeter to 10 to the 6-ish, 7-ish. Once you have your chemical composition, you can look at the various heating and cooling processes that are available and plug that in also. You solve an energy equation that has heating and cooling terms on the right-hand side and at each time step for each cell or each SPH particle or a repo collocation element, you um, solve the local chemical network. So this is to scare you. These are the... Um, Cooling functions, fine structure lines, vibrational lines of CO, uh, of H2CO, etc., etc. These are the chemical reactions, and I come to these guys in more detail. Now we come to the photo and cosmic ray rates. So this can be solved. Now, if you solve it, you notice that you form H2 relatively quickly. So this is now a plot of the H2 mass fraction. Um, in these weird units, it is normalized to one half because it is a number density. So if you take two hydrogen atoms and put it into one molecule, certainly the fraction in number density is one half if it's fully molecular. So it's a question of notation. This is the notation we adopt in Heidelberg. And you see, despite the fact that the density is on average, not very high. You form H2 very quickly and you keep it in a high density, in a high H2 fraction state. So why is that? Because chemistry has a memory effect. So you have shocks that brings the gas to high densities. It can form H2 quickly, then it may disperse again, but then it depends on the extinction it finds itself in. So it suddenly becomes a non-local problem that depends on environmental <coughs> conditions. And it turns out for this particular type of clouds, the extinction you have is enough to keep the H2 alive even in lower density environments. Because you cycle lots of materials through high density shocks that disperse again, you quickly come up with a very high H2 fraction. These are the associated uh, carbon species, so C+. Plus, Usually, most initially, most of the stuff is in uh, atomic carbon, but it finds its oxygen and quickly becomes molecular with the C plus and C levels dropping. So this is then in the more tenuous part. This is in the intermediate density part, and this would be in the high density regions. You can look at images: total column density, H2 column density, 12 CO column density, temperature. You see, depending on what cooling species you have, what compressional heating you had, you have a wide range of densities from, let's say, 100 down to 10, 20. Again, not dissimilar to what you see in nearby molecular cloud regions. You can then look at the ratio between the H2 column density and the carbon monoxide column density, and you see, again, that some reason in some regions, H2 exists, but it is not traced well by carbon monoxide. And I will come to that later. So, with this type of calculations, we can ask a few questions. So, one that has been raised in the literature is, do we need molecules, actually, to form stars? And it has been argued that you need the superior cooling power of carbon monoxide <coughs> to provide sufficient cooling to form stars. Now, it turns out that also C plus is an efficient coolant, or C. So in spectroscopic terms, C2 and C1 are efficient coolants. So you can look at typical cooling curves. 
I show you later how to calculate that. So this is the cooling rate in ergs per cubic centimeters per second. So what do you lose in terms of energy density per second in a certain volume of your gas? And you calculate that for certain density range, 1,000, 10, uh, 100,000, et cetera. And this is a complicated plot because it's the result of such a chemical dynamical network. You can identify different heating mechanisms, but also different cooling mechanisms. So these are the CO-related cooling mechanisms. Molecular <coughs> dominates at above 10 to the 4. Uh, atomic carbon that sits in this density range, so it has a tiny peak where it is important for the cooling. C+, plus, which dominates in the more tenuous gas. But if you look at that, you know, this is just a factor of two. So there is hardly any difference between the cooling provided by C+, plus, C1, and CO. This is stuff when it couples to the dust, which acts as a thermostat. So you can do this type of calculations and simply say, oh, I switch off certain reactions in my chemical network. What do I get if I physically incorrect and deliberately switch off the formation of molecules? So if I, for some miraculous reasons, would just keep atoms and ions in my gas, so no molecule formation permitted with a full-fledged network, and you see <coughs> the cooling curves do not look dissimilar. So again, this is the C plus cooling, which now is here because I prevent the carbon on the monoxide to find each other, pair themselves to uh, CO. In reality, this would happen. You would be losing the C plus here, and you would be picking up the CO as the gas becomes self-shielded for the H2 and dust shielded for the carbon monoxide. So no difference in these average cooling lines. So the red stuff are typically heating rates, photoelectric heating, UV pumping. I come to that also. So you can play around, allow for different molecules to form, different routes to take place or not take place. And it turns out that what really counts is the dust shielding. If you switch off dust shielding, the gas remains high at 100 Kelvin throughout the entire density range. But if you allow for dust shielding, atomic gas, just H2, H2 with carbon monoxide and atomic gas <coughs> with CO and the full-fledged molecular network, you see there's hardly any difference. These are typical phase diagrams. I show you more of that. Temperature here, 110, well, goes down to maybe seven-ish when then cosmic ray heating kicks in. And density is from 10 to a million. So it drops, couples to the dust, which acts as a thermostat. The dynamical variations diminish, and you are very well constrained by a single effective equation of state. So this suggests that you know molecules are not needed. They are mere tracer. And you can ask, do they form actually stars? Can these clouds go into collapse? And the answer is yes. They all do go into collapse more or less actually at the same time, only the one that is purely atomic takes, this is time in uh, <coughs> mega years, this is just um, time sequence or the, the, the region in time when gravitation collapse becomes important. Oh, I walk too much, you have to focus always on me. <laughs> <laughs> I try to be more, more solid. Okay, in any case, what you see is there is a slight delay in star formation, in collapse, but all of these objects become gravitationally unstable. So yes, if you suppress molecule formation, it's a bit harder for the gas to go into collapse and form stars, but it's not impossible. Good, that solves this question. H2 is a tracer, at least at these conditions that are geared towards the Milky Way. We can now ask, what is it if you go to the LMC, to the SMC, what happens if you go to more primordial gas? So if you play now with metallicity. So we look at the extension to, to lower metallicity. So this is the case we just debated. One solar metallicity, a third, so something like the 
LMC, like the SMC, a tenth, a thirtieth, a hundredth. And you notice if you start with fully atomic initial conditions and fully molecular initial conditions, the curves, again, temperature density diagrams, look very similar. However, we notice if we remove uh, the metallicity, if we go down and down, we see that dust shielding becomes less and less efficient in sustaining, say, CO and other things. So on average, you get higher temperatures. So you drop down to below 10 Kelvin. Here, the minimum density you get is something like, I don't know, 50 Kelvin or so. Nevertheless, same procedure as before. If you get warmer, it just takes longer to accumulate enough mass to go into collapse. So this is the time for collapse, molecular and atomic initial conditions. And you see there is almost a linear, well, kind of linear relation in when collapse starts. But once it keeps going, nothing helps. So also at low metallicities, there will be probably no molecular gas needed to form stars. So this is certainly the result of the work by Simon Glover and Paul Clark, but also Krumholz has an uh, analytic model on that. Now, <coughs> the interesting thing becomes is we can ask, what would the observer see? And the observer would see here, this is the um, emission that one sees from the transition zero to one of the carbon monoxide molecule. And this is the total column density in the region, right? So we take such a cube, we do post-processing radiative transfer with RATMC. You will be playing with RATMC a bit tomorrow. And out comes a position-position velocity cube, which we can analyze as the observers analyze it. And we notice that there is CO everywhere, CO emission everywhere. This is in terms of equivalent width of the CO line. But as we go down and down, we can have um, no, molecular hydrogen. But because CO needs dust for the shielding, it becomes more difficult to sustain CO. And you need to go to higher and higher densities to accumulate enough dust column. So you notice that for very low metallicities, only very minute regions, there where you actually have collapse taking place, these are traced by CO. While there's lots of hydrogen that is not traced by CO, the situation is much better at present metallicities. The fraction of hydrogen, molecular hydrogen that is traced by CO and molecular <coughs> hydrogen that is not traced by CO is so-so, 50-50, but it becomes very large if you go to these columns and these metallicities. So this tells us that CO should actually be a better tracer of star formation if you go to reduced metallicity. And indeed, you need to adjust the CO tracing star formation conversion factor if you go to low and lower metallicities. Good. We can ask yet another question. We can ask Jim Pringle's question. Is there molecular hydrogen that is invisible, that we simply do not see? So why would that be? The idea is that H2 could be in a tenuous phase that permits them at extinction level, that permits self-shielding to be <coughs> relevant, but dust shielding not yet to be relevant. Why should that work? The reason is if you look at these old picture that I scanned in many years ago. Um, this is again an image or an artist impression of a photodissociation region. You have UV flux from the outside. You go deeper into the cloud and you see a transition from um, ionized hydrogen to atomic hydrogen and an extinction of roughly one you turn molecular. That has to do with self-shielding. But CO cannot self-shield. It relies on dust to provide extinction. And it turns out that the transition from C <coughs> plus to C and CO takes place at extinctions of roughly three, four. So there are regions, if you think of 
your favorite spherical cloud, there should be a layer where you have H2, but no, not yet uh, CO. And if you have a turbulent gas where you have very weird extinction patterns and in a strange way correlated with the density and column densities, then this could be an appreciable fraction. <coughs> so that was a proposition that Jim Pringle and Ron Allen made many, many years ago. And you can test it on a computer. So you can, and I show you now, not this turbulence in a box driven with some Gaussian scheme, but a bit more physical. I say, if indeed molecular clouds formed by a conversion flow of atomic hydrogen, then let's model that on the computer. Let us basically set up your computation domain such that there comes a stream of atomic hydrogen from the left, while at the right, the middle, middle, I let, I let my chemistry and people in cooling spots draw and I'm asking, asking what, would what would they see? How much, how much hydrogen, hydrogen, molecular hydrogen, 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 16 kilometers per second, and here it was something like 6 to 7, seven kilometers per second. second. And what you notice now is there is an accumulation phase where the cloud is held together by RAM pressure, but is not yet locally dense and massive enough to go into star formation. And if you look at the time scales, this goes from 0 to 15 mega years in the slow flow, this goes from 0 to 5 mega years in the fast flow. And there is this phase here where the maximum density hovers around at a more or less constant value. The temperature also stays roughly constant. You build up mass. The interface between the accreting material and the RAM pressure confined yet to turn into a cloud material goes further out and further out and suddenly it becomes gravitationally unstable and schwoop, you see the first collapse. Same in the fast flow, the only thing, it takes a bit, well, less time. We can look at the um, H2 fractions um, and the CO fractions. So this was looking at the maximum density and the temperature. This is now looking at the chemistry. Um, so this is C plus that we have everywhere in the outskirts. <coughs> this is now the molecular hydrogen. And you see in this hovering phase, we already have a high amount of, so we have a molecular cloud. However, it is not traced by CO. The level of CO is very small. And CO only rises just shortly before we go into collapse. Here it's a bit less clear, it rises more continuously, but the same thing, more or less. And you have seen these images before. So this is two mega years before the first star forms. This is one mega year before the first star forms at the onset of star formation and slightly thereafter. So you see again, there's lots of H2 that is not so much traced by carbon monoxide. And only later on, you see a correlation between the high density molecular hydrogen and the CO. So it looks like Jim Pringle and Ron Allen are right. There <coughs> should be phases where we have lots of tenuous H2 that is invisible to us. And only when we are already in a density where star formation sets in, CO becomes a good tracer. And that, of course, has implications for our interpretation of molecular cloud dynamics. It also turns out that on average CO, the line weights are slightly smaller because it forms the stagnation points of a conversion flow than the average line which line width should be. So if you do a virial balance analysis, you introduce certain biases. Good. So these were three examples of very recent developments in this field. The X factor will be covered, so the conversion factor in more detail will be covered by Nick Gnedin. Good. Let me start discussing the heating and cooling processes in more detail before we break. 
And you have already seen in the list from Simon Glover's paper, um, there is quite a lot of heating and cooling processes. So these are processes that provide mostly heating, photoelectric heating. Heating by H2 <coughs> formation, you release latent heat that is available <coughs> to the kinematics of the gas. Uh, excitation and photodissociation of molecular hydrogen. Cosmic rays can penetrate deep into the cloud and provide a minimum heating level where all the other things fail. Clearly heating by dust and the interstellar radiation field is important. Shock heating, so the simple PDV heating that makes the air hot as you pump up your bicycle tire, for instance, this also works here. But PDV from gas dynamics can also cool, just like what you have in your, re your refrigerator. <coughs> if the shock goes away, the gas may expand and hence cool. <coughs> so the PDV heating, the dynamical heating, can act as a heating or a cooling term. Cooling can be provided by molecular lines of H2 in high densities, so this is more geared towards primordial gas, but or very high densities and high temperatures, or CO, etc. And then there are many fine structure lines of atomics, um, of, of atoms and radicals. So there are a few things that need to be taken into account. What is the equation of state? that you assume. So when you say PV is NKT that you have for, um, for an ideal monoatomic gas, there is, um, or you could say P is kappa times rho to some kind of gamma and gamma is then the ratio of the specific heats, right? I think Cp over Cv. And for the monoatomic adiabatic transition, it is 5 thirds. But we do not have monoatomic molecules. They have internal degrees of freedom. In addition, the gas has different compositions with different mean molecular weights, etc., etc. So what you would need to do is you would need to adjust the adiabatic index, even if you treat the gas as an ideal gas and put all the internal degrees of freedom into heating and cooling functions that work on the energy density equation. So this is something that is often neglected. You need to deal also with the adiabatic index to do it right, to adjust and accommodate the chemical composition changes. And of course, energy transfer between dust and gas can both work as a heating and a cooling process. So in order to understand these processes in more detail, I think it is illustrative to go back to the very basics and discuss quickly what we remember from discussing the two-level system. So the idea is we have a system that has an internal degree of freedom that in the most simple case we can excite radiatively. That was Einstein's work. I can say I have an upper level, E2 is the ground level plus some transition energy and it has some um, statistical weight that takes care of the degeneracy of these energy levels <coughs> with respect to say spin or angular momentum quantum numbers um, oh, and this should be G2, and this, yeah. So this should be G1. And so both levels have an energy and a an, uh, statistical weight factor. And you can excite this transition by, let's say, if you are in the upper level, <coughs> by spontaneous emission. So the spontaneous emission coefficient A2 to 1 is the probability per unit time for a spontaneous transition from the upper to the ground level. Good. You can do the same, saying, oh, I'm sitting at the ground level now, a photon comes happily along, it fits <coughs> in frequency, and I grab it. So you can have classical absorption. The transition um, <coughs> probability is then this B2 to 1. No, this is wrong. Sorry, this must be B1 to 2. 
you see I was tired when I made this, times now the ambient radiation field. I need to know how many photons go by. So this couples these transition probabilities to the radiation field. And I pick only um, photons that fit this frequency range. So this is a transition probability per unit time for stimulated emission of the photon. So, no, 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 here we are. So for the absorption from one to two. Now, it was Einstein who said, but there could be also stimulated emission. Let's say a photon comes along and I'm sitting already in the excited state. Lots of adrenaline. And now the photon says, oh, please come along with me. And I go down and suddenly I have two photons that go coherently along with each other. So stimulated emission, same thing, depends on intensity, but now has a transition probability two to one. And EV is the extinction, and these have are rates in units of one over second. And these are the famous Einstein coefficients, which he used to do cool things in, um, well, in quantum mechanics. There is one slight complication. There is a certain natural line width to these transitions. They have certain, let's say, durations for the transition that by Heisenberg's uncertainty principle convert into an energy <coughs> uncertainty. So instead of having really a delta function for the frequency for the absorption, it is more like, well, it is like a Lorentz profile. It has some width. So it is better to work on some integrated frequency, integrated intensity that I call like that. Anyway, what can I do? I do what the chemists always do. I go to detailed balance. I say in equilibrium, the forward reactions should balance the backward reactions. I have one forward reaction. This excites the state. And I have two backward reactions. So this is absorption, spontaneous emission, stimulated emission. So as depicted here. And now I can solve for the intensity that I need, right? The intensity is simply this thing here. Now I can ask, well, what is the population of these levels? And now thermodynamics comes into play because now I can ask, can extend that I can, for instance, uh, also include collisional excitations and de-excitations. I do that after the break. But let's remain in the purely radiative regime. We see that for thermodynamic equilibrium, Okay, so the radiation is a black body. We have the number of ground level states and the number of um, excited level states scale simply as this thing that mean the ratio of the statistical weights by the transition energy. So if we have equilibrium, this holds, I can put this and this together and I have an expression in thermodynamic equilibrium what the mean intensity should be, and it only depends on these fundamental quantum mechanical quantities, the three Einstein coefficients. Good. Because it's in thermodynamic equilibrium, I know what the spectrum is. Per definition, it is Planck spectrum. So Planck spectrum is just repeated here, and if I have that, this gives me immediately a relation between the Einstein coefficients. So between um, absorption and stimulated emission and for um, spontaneous emission. Now, the derivation assumes thermodynamic equilibrium. However, these are only fundamental quantum mechanical quantities, electron mass. Uh, Planck's constant, etc., speed of light, etc., etc. So even though we have derived it from thermodynamic equilibrium, it always holds. So you know that, right? You remember that from your fundamental electrodynamics. Is it true? Mm -hmm. You have forgotten it? No. Good, no. Okay, uh, too fast. Um, now, if you then talk with a spectroscopist, or if you now want to use this knowledge to calculate radiative rates, 
then you often find the Einstein coefficients related or expressed in terms of the oscillator strings. So the oscillator strings is a quantity you find in, let's say, quantum chemical tables where people have measured or calculated from first principle the transition <coughs> strengths and probabilities. So they would provide that in order to go to Einstein's coefficients, you need to put it into this formula. So in principle, the oscillator strength is, if you wish, very coarsely the number of oscillation it takes for the transition to take place. And the spontaneous transition rate is proportional to the uh, frequency to the third power. An example would be an electronic dipole transition where this is simply the electronic dipole or the dipole matrix element. We can go back to that. We find further relations between the emissivity and Einstein's A coefficient. So if you look at the equations of radiative transfer, the idea is you have a ray of intensity nu, it goes through some material, you're asking how does the intensity change as my ray travels through this medium? And you write d i d s, let's say this is now the distance s that you travel, and you take out something that is proportional to the absorption coefficient at these frequencies, but there may be also some emissivity. Think of thermal radiation. If you are at thermal wavelength, that adds <coughs> intensity to my ray. So you can relate now this emissivity to Einstein's coefficients. And you can also then relate the, emissivi uh, the, the absorption coefficient to Einstein's B coefficient. And if you have stimulated emission, you basically have an effective um, absorption coefficient. Ah, here's the equation. So you can write the equation of radiative transfer in terms of Einstein coefficients. Now you can also write that in terms of um, the optical depth tau is something like alpha s, then you get d i nu d tau is minus intensity plus, and you have now a quantity that is the, um, yeah, the source function emissivity divided by the absorption coefficient. So this is now the simple most form of your radiative transfer equation and you can now use Einstein's coefficients to get the source function. And we will use that later on after the break when we discuss um, photoreactions and things like that. So let me end here by um, introducing two cases. So often you hear the term LTE, local thermodynamic equilibrium, and this simply means that the level populations are following a thermal distribution, a Boltzmann distribution. So the ratio between level one and level two simply scales as the transition energy divided by the thermal energy modulo the statistical weights. So we can plug that in and we get then an <coughs> expression for the absorption coefficient and the source function is simply the Planck function. That is extremely useful if you have LTE, you know what your source function is, you want to know the temperature. Now in most cases you have non-thermal emission. So this is not the case and if you have a population inversion, so for some reason <coughs> you have more in N2 than in N1, then you can have stimulated emission, you can have laser activity, or because it's typically at microwaves in astrophysical quantities, it's masers. Good. I think we should break here and we go to more thermodynamics of dust.
how long do we want this to break? I think five, five minutes.